Hi, I'm Greg Lindsay, and welcome to the second episode of the all new, all different Big Rethink. Coming to you live here from inside the mm -hmm app, if you haven't seen it before, the new hotness when it comes to virtual presentations. So this week, I'm proud to have as my guest, Benjamin De La Pena. Uh, Benji, as we know him, uh, is a former program officer and exec at uh, the Rockefeller and Knight Foundations, and then of course, also the head of innovation at Seattle's Department of Transportation. These days, he writes a newsletter, Makeshift Mobility, as sort of the leading voice covering informal transport in the global south. So if you've been listening to me and following our commotion arm as well, you know, we've talked ad nauseum about the effects of the pandemic on transportation, mostly in the global north. We're going to have Benji on a little bit to talk particularly about the effects and inequalities that are rippling through the global south when it comes to informal transport. But for first, let's get into mm -hmm, and, uh, and get into uh, uh, basically show off uh, my slides for this week here. So let me pull those right up here. Got to work on making that ever smoother here. But let's get started, shall we? Um, so with that, got to jump through about three apps. Starting off this week, we began the last episode here, of course, with Hurricane Isaias, uh, which was the ninth named storm in the Atlantic. I bring this up because NOAA, the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association Administration, has pointed out this will be perhaps the busiest named storm season in the Atlantic ever. They're predicting 19 to 25 named storms, which obviously puts into the realm of consideration perhaps the first ever complete use of the alphabet when it comes to Atlantic storm season. Uh, not a record I think we ever needed to beat. Um, there we go. We can see Isaiah's churning. Um, also want to bring up also in the last week or so, you know, a, a, there's been a, a letter sent to the American Planning Association by over 650 at that time of counting planners calling for the APA to, to support calls to defund the police. And this, of course, has come out of the controversy and the anger um, that perhaps the, the killing by police of Breonna Taylor was linked to a special unit created to help gentrify neighborhoods in Louisville. And this, among other various issues, a whole litany, of course, uh, involved with the planning discipline has led to these planners calling for the APA to defund police because of their role in spatializing and concretizing inequality and, and racial inequality in American cities. So we're watching to see if the APA will, of course, actually endorse that. I also want to bring up because of the ongoing uh, sort of calls here of, of basically the, uh, well, the death of American cities, supposedly, the flight to the countryside. Uh, you know, we talk a bit about this on The Big Rethink. Um, this is some data that just came out from Zumper, which is a new site uh, that basically helps to, to doing rent comparisons. And I'm going to bring this up because they have been doing month by month data analysis of rents in various cities. Um, so this very granular information showing you, uh, one of three screens here showing you changes in rent in American cities. And what's interesting is, is that American cities aren't dying, at least when it comes to you know, year over year decreases in rent, but certainly San Francisco, New York, Boston, some of the real heavyweight cities are showing precipitous declines. Year over year rent for a one bedroom in San Francisco is down 11%. New York is down nearly 7%. Um, we're seeing Denver is down almost 10% as well. But when you get deeper into the, into the tabulations here into lower rent cities, you can see huge booms in various places. Nashville, rents are up 11% year over year. 12% in Newark, 14% in Chesapeake, Virginia, uh, Boise up 11%. And particularly here in the lower ones, Des Moines, Norfolk, St. Louis, of course, uh, St. Louis, where police faced off against protesters on the anniversary of Mike Brown's death in Ferguson, Missouri. In St. Louis, rents are up 15%. So here we can see it. the worry is not, of course, that people will flee these cities and cause rent to fall, but we're seeing in America's secondary and tertiary cities, this sort of not flight to the countryside, but a flight to where rents are cheaper. Uh, Zumper, which published this analysis, called it a sort of rent squeeze, where people are fleeing high rents in coastal metros and running to rapidly rising rents in secondary and tertiary cities. So we'll see how this develops for people who are basically, as, as America, of course, faces this looming eviction crisis, 108 million American households that are now uh, on the other side of federal, federal universal basic income and protections on evictions. So this is something we're obviously going to be watching in the weeks and months to come to see if the fear of the avalanche of evictions uh, will soon take place. And, you know, this, of course, again, takes against the backdrop here of rising unemployment and the incredible spatial inequality in American cities of unemployment. The New York Times published this analysis showing here the, as you can see on the left, uh, or I forget, uh, the mirror recording here, um, but the lighter shades of Los Angeles were in unemployment levels prior to the pandemic. You can now see the huge spikes, the deep purple uh, of rising unemployment rates in central Los Angeles. Uh, also, of course, in the south side of Chicago, again, another historically black neighborhood, incredibly spatially segregated over decades of this. 
Um, and, you know, even in New York, of course, where, you know, where unemployment rates in the Bronx, for example, are, are rising to above 30%, while in Manhattan, they've barely bumped 10%. So not only, of course, is America facing a, a steep recession uh, and also an eviction crisis, but it's one that is highly segregated and highly spatialized. And you know, we're starting to see some responses to this. This is a close-up Manhattan here. You can see that purple over in Queens uh, is uh, you know, basically some of the, the largest public housing uh, complex in New York, if not the United States there, near what would have been the Amazon HQ2. Uh, this brings the news as of yesterday, as this recording here, that you know, Jamie Dimon and Jeff Bezos himself are among the CEOs pledging to hire 100,000 so-called typically underserved New Yorkers over the next decade. So we're seeing corporate CEOs step up against this mounting tide of anger as, as the technology giants and banks are doing so well in the stock market, pledging to hire these people amidst the steep rise in inequality and, and unemployment. Now, of course, also in New York, and we'll focus on New York for a few moments here because so much coverage and so much news. Uh, this is from Eater today showing that, yeah, no one knows exactly how many restaurants have closed in New York since COVID began. Well over a thousand by their counting. Yelp has data showing that something like 2,600 small businesses have permanently closed in Manhattan alone. Um, and this, of course, comes against the backdrop as we've seen you know, the various efforts to create socially distanced dining. This is from a Time story on how David Rockwell, the architect who, who released plans earlier in the pandemic, um, has started to see them built. Um, in Chinatown on Mott Street, um, various restaurateurs have created sort of communal outdoor dining programs, which are very nice. Uh, these are some shots here. I bring this up because in part, the next destination for these Rockwell creations will be in my old neighborhood of Jackson Heights, Queens. Now Jackson Heights, and you can sort of see here the, the initial discussions and planning it having here in Diversity Plaza. Jackson Heights is interesting in several respects. Uh, number one, it's you know, arguably the most diverse neighborhood or zip code in New York, if not in the United States. Second, it's an extremely working class community of color, uh, exactly the kind of neighborhood that many planners have criticized cities for abandoning or, or unacknowledging in their efforts to create socially distanced spacing. It was also, of course, the epicenter of the epicenter of New York's infection in, in March and April. Um, antibody tests show that 60% of residents uh, have antibodies or were exposed to infection. And this will be the place where we're going to actually start to see the city roll them out next. And it's also one of the more successful applications of the Open Streets Initiative. Um, so this is uh, 34th Avenue in my old neighborhood. Now, because I have to poke fun of the New York Times, where I'm getting some of this stuff from, at the same time, you know, well-to-do white New Yorkers are, of course, discovering the joys of car ownership. This is from Sunday Styles today. Uh, the real estate sections published a piece asking, which is the perfect suburb for you? Are you more of a, you know, a Marinette guy? Are you more of a, you know, Montclair, New Jersey guy? Um, and so this, of course, is happening at the same time as we've seen, you know, beginnings of a recovery in auto sales in the United States. Um, you know, part of the reasons we've seen so much discussion about creating open streets and pushing back against the car is because of this, you know, rising fear of increased auto traffic and congestion as people are afraid of public transportation. And if, that, if things weren't bad enough in the United States, this has happened against a backdrop, as this is from Bloomberg data, polling from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, that Americans don't even buy cars anymore. They only buy trucks. And I mean, pickup trucks and of course SUVs now comprise more than three quarters of all new US auto sales. So these are the stakes for what's playing out there. And it's just a few final data points here before I bring out my guest. Uh, Airbnb has uh, you know, basically broken plans here that it plans to quietly file for an IPO this month. This is interesting because of course, Airbnb is now selling against the dream that longer term stays, that you know, working from home means working from someone else's home, perhaps in the Catskills or in uh, Bear Mountain outside of Los Angeles or other sort of rural retreats will replace its short stay business in tourist-centric global capitals like Venice or Barcelona. So we'll see if, in, how investors caught into this. Um, also want to point out you know, that against the backdrop of everything else, you know, we've seen big chains are starting to rethink their portfolios in the centers of cities. This is interesting, J. Crew, I point this out because you know, there's that old saying that if you, know, you owe the bank a little bit of money, the bank owns you. But if you owe the bank a lot of money, you may own the bank or at least your creditors. So J. Crew successfully squeezed $130 million in rent relief from its various landlords to keep its stores open. And you know, the ultimate example of this is the news that broke that Amazon is in talks with SL Green, the giant mall operator, or I'm sorry, Simon Property Group, the giant mall operator, um, to basically begin the formal conversion of its various malls into Amazon distribution centers. So perhaps the ultimate cynical example of if you can't beat them, join them uh, at vastly reduced rents per square foot, I should add. Uh, and that brings us out of that. So let me, let's see, take us out of here. And then I'd like to welcome on my, my, uh, my co-host today, uh, Benji LaPena, come on out from behind the virtual Zoom screen. There we go. Uh, hey, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Happy to be here. 
with all of that wonderful news you just went through. <laughs> I, I promise this is the second time we've done this format and, and um, I'm, I think I've managed to get bleaker this week than last time. <laughs> I know. Real sure. Shining beacon of hope at this moment, but, uh, but, but a good place to start a conversation. It is indeed. Well, this, as I say, it is a good place to start a conversation. You and I have many conversations over the years about informal transport. I say, yes. among, among other things, uh, when I wrote for New Cities in 2016, uh, now arriving, a sort of look at global transportation trends, you are really my guide to Manila, which is one of the four focus cities, and really mm -hmm. helped me understand the layout there. And you've, at the, you help fund projects with the World Bank on understanding and mapping informal transit networks. So as yeah. a starting question is, what have you seen happening in the global south? I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're worried here about, you know, how do we uh, disinfect trains and how do we basically right. socially distance in metro stations? Obviously, these considerations are magnified intensely right. when it's a jeep near Matatu. So yep. what's happening in, in places like Nairobi and Manila? The pattern is the same in that you, if you have good government, competent government, then you are able to deploy uh, controls and sanitation on public transportation, whether it be formal public transportation or informal public transportation. And if you have crappy government, incompetent government, then it will suck. So I, on the good side example, you look at Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Vietnam uh, doesn't have auto rickshaws. They banned auto tuk-tuks, they banned tuk-tuks, but they have a lot of motorcycle taxis, right? And uh, Matatu style minibuses. And very, very early on, they created uh, both the communications campaign on cleaning your hands, uh, very nice ditty tunes that, you, that would play and got viral. Uh, they had programs for the operators. Uh, they needed to provide masks to the passengers. They would clean the motorcycle or the vehicle before someone got on. Uh, they would report uh, a passenger who had symptoms and in fact would suggest that, would you like to stop by to get tested? Hmm. And at the end of the ride, they would have the cleaning operations and were required to change uniforms and all of that. And of course, Vietnam has been doing wonders, right? Right up there with, with New Zealand. I'd say, yeah, Vietnam is one of the most successful countries on the planet in beating COVID. Ab so, yeah. Absolutely. And then you've got places like India, the Philippines, Lagos, uh, Nairobi, <laughs> where it is a mess, right? So in the Philippines, they shut down, uh, but they didn't quite have a plan. They started opening up again, but were controlling what could go out. So, uh, so they, uh, in the middle of all of this, they basically tried to implement their vehicle modernization program. And so they were in the middle of trying to transition from the old jeepneys to these new e-jeepneys, they called them. Really, they were minibuses. Um, and they started, when they started lifting it, the, the quarantine, I think about a month or so or two months ago, uh, they only let the new buses, the mini buses out in the traditional jeepneys, they wouldn't let out. Well, the new buses, there were like 1,500 of them mm -hmm. and there were 55,000 jeepneys. And unlike informal transportation, right? So if you, the New York Metropolitan uh, Authority or Transit Authority decides, we're not gonna run the subways, you, your employees still get paid. Yeah. Right. At some point, you might furlough them, but they've got payments and benefits. In informal transportation, the driver earns from the daily fare. So no, fa no, no trips, no fares. Right. So no income. And what they had was aid in terms of foods for drivers, but that stretched on for five months and now there's none. And then they had to step back again. The medical community two weeks ago or a week ago said, wait, we have to lock down again because the cases are rising and we're not able to, to, to cope with it. And the president begrudgingly past midnight agreed, okay, I'm gonna lock it down for two weeks again. He announced it at one in the morning, it was gonna apply that same day. So there was no plans. And uh, the toughest part is for the frontliners. How do they get to the hospitals, right? And so there's an increase of bike use. The Department of Transportation is grudgingly trying to build out uh, bike lanes, they're very, uh, it's, it's haphazard. The Metro Batela Development Authority is, is dragging their feet. Uh, so it, it's the same uh, lesson, right? If there's bad government, you can't make up for it. And they like, do and have a, sorry, go ahead. I was saying the same problems. If you, you know, if you have a you know, dysfunctional approach to transportation in the global north, we're seeing the same dysfunctions in the global south as well. You could be the global superpower with the largest defense spending in the world and be failing at uh, dealing with the pandemic. I, I, Familiar. I think we're seeing just that, yeah. 
Um, well, one thing, the other thing I think that that that, uh, that is interesting too is, of course, you know, one of the one of the more ominous themes of the pandemic. You know, going back to the you know crisis is a terrible thing to waste. To quote Paul Romer, who of yeah. course has been promoting testing programs and tracing. Um, you know, we've seen Apple and Google, you know, rolling out tracing apps. Various governments doing that. That's the global north perspective, right? Big tech right. giants doing this. In the global south, it plays out as you know trying to basically use this moment to sneak in cashless payments which has some advantages, but also as a way to basically squeeze out the use of cash and capture right. those benefits for that too. Right. So Google's tried this before in, in Nairobi and failed. What's happening now when it comes to how the tech companies are trying to move in? Well, before I answer the tech companies, so the Philippines is trying to do tech uh, contact tracing on public transport. And what they do is when you come up to the train, you fill up a little one fourth sheet of paper with your name, your address and everything on it and put it in a box. Wow. And supposedly they collect that. No one knows what it gets used, but there have been stories of, you know, someone finding your name, you're particularly attractive, they'll start calling you, whatever. Uh, contact, a cashless fare collection, uh, the problem is that a lot of governments don't know how to think about it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what they tried to do is they tried to, in, what happened first in Nairobi was, Google tried it in Nairobi about a decade ago, Biba Pay, uh, about a million Kenyans uh, decided to get the card. It was a stored value card. And they recruited uh, uh, quite a bit of Matatus to try to use this tap card. Eventually, the Matatus didn't like using it. So you would get on the Matatu, you have your tap card and say, oh, the unit's broken. You can't tap in. And here's your cash, right? You have to pay in cash. So all of those resources became stranded and it failed. They're trying again now with a whole bunch of operators, tap and go, um, I think Google's in there too. Uh, I think three providers, right? The problem with it is they're not interoperable. So sometimes you'll have to wait an hour to find the Matatu that accepts your card, mm -hmm. even if a whole bunch of Matatus going in the same direction are, 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 are ahead of it because your cash is stuck in a particular card. Um, Kigali went the other way in 2016. They mandated uh, uh, cashless fare collection and they awarded it to one company, Tap and Go, and it's still in operation, and now they're, they're, they're uh, requiring even more of it because of COVID-19, right? So there's no exchange in cash. Problem is that uh, the only place to get the card is at the terminal. And so you have people lining up with people with, with, uh, with clerks who have uh, these uh, credit card payment systems or cash collection systems, and that's where you get your card, which also still creates the whole, you're lining up and queuing. I was saying, let's hope no one has a cough. Exactly. And then, and then the card then captures your money. And if you're in the middle of the route and you don't have a card, how do you get on the Matatu or the bus, right? So all of this, and I, I, I think what's in my last issue of makeshift mobility, the title was God Knows Who Does Not Pay, which is a play. I don't know if you saw this in Manila, but nearly every Jeep had this, you know, punny letter and who does was spelled Judas with, a, with an H, right? And it's kind of a, a, a way to, to shame fair evaders. Um, and that also was a title of a forum that Move Us One Coalition, which is an advocacy coalition on transportation in the Philippines, did on cashless fare collection. Um, and what was interesting in the forum was we had transportation opera cooperatives talk about their experience that had started mm -hmm. rolling it out. And all of these things came out, right? So a lot of users didn't know how to use it, right? Especially the older uh, passengers, right? And so they needed to be assisted with it. Uh, sometimes the unit would uh, display an error that was just some cryptic tech error and it would cascade. So now you, the unit would have to write everyone for free and then wait till the end of the line for someone to repair it, right? Or if you were in the middle of the ride and you don't have a car, then you can't get on. And their biggest, the two biggest thing was interoperability because you couldn't use it anywhere else. And it was costly for them to maintain internet connections. That's the one thing they're asking government for because you need mm -hmm. internet bandwidth, uh, if not during the ride itself, because the, the fare is calculated by GPS, right? But uh, at the station, at least when it starts uploading all of those things, which is then a recurring cost for the cooperatives, which again, they're only earning money from the fares. Mm -hmm. At the same time though, you have the big ride hail companies that started as ride hail. So you get Gojek and, and Grab, uh, realizing that the real market for them is cashless uh, payments. 
Mm -hmm. So you could have I, I a say, they're, turn, they're turning into financial companies. Gojek just oh, raised like a billion dollars in part from Facebook. And really they're absolutely. becoming an informal banking system. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the EMV, right? The European uh, MasterCard Visa uh, cabal is really threatened by it because they're like 10% at best of Southeast Asia. And you have all of these unbanked people and ride hail apps are growing, growing really fast. You can pay for, use the app to pay in a convenience store or a salon. They even have a way to pay for rent and utilities and mortgage wow. using your app, which is great for the user, right? Because you can use it in so many places, but then you lose completely the uh, use of the technology to optimize and manage the system. Yeah. Right? So that's what they're not being able to get ahead. And you still have equity problems, right? If I don't have a smartphone, how do I ride? Yeah. Or if I shift to a tap and go and now my, 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 my money is stuck here, uh, how do I ride? For the drivers, uh, the tap and go systems, needed, you needed a bank account of some sort. The apps then have some sort of cash payment. So that works better for them. Uh, but again, all of this is rolling down without a clear discussion of equity issues, governance issues, and societal issues, mm -hmm. which if you stopped and thought about it and, and governments are currently not equipped and said, what are the design principles we need to implement here, right? And so you take human-centered design, mm -hmm. society-centered design, and say, okay, if we thought of all of that and there was some design exercise, what should cashless fare collection do, including vehicle location systems that are part of it? What should it do for the system? No. Well, I would say we only have a few minutes left, but- um, no, Sorry, I, I went on. <laughs> no, that was great. Because I would say my last big question, obviously, is, you know, so in, you know, in the state side, you know, looking back in the global north for a minute, you know, um, you know we had on earlier, earlier this year, you know, uh, in Canada, you know, gig workers are already ruled as dependent contractors. And now major decisions yeah. have come down against Uber and Lyft in both New York and California that they are employees and need full benefits, right. unemployment benefits. Um, what would be your or what would be your predictions for what's going to happen in sort of the U.S. global north markets based on what you're seeing in the global south? What's translatable about how things might change? I mean, could we see more driver cooperatives? An off-mooted idea in the global north, but maybe that's you know, if Uber and Lyft basically figure out how to slough off their obligations or break themselves up somehow, could we see more cooperatives? Or what else do you think might evolve? I think in more collective Western societies that probably will happen. Mm -hmm. Although you look at you look at France, right, where there's everyone is unionized, and there's just mighty struggle, right, with uh, the yellow the yellow vests, right, is just a continuation of the protests against when Uber started rolling out, right, the whole clash between the uh, black cab drivers and the, what the knowledge, mm -hmm. and in the London. whole ride hail, right, in London, uh, and that clash of that, so. I, I would hope that in more collective societies, they will figure out a way to provide more benefits to the drivers. Uh, the, the Global South is failing at it. You have cooperatives, but they're transportation, co transportation operator cooperatives mm -hmm. with the drivers as employees. And there's really no union voice. There are the national, uh, the transport workers unions, the International Federation of Transport Unions is trying to organize the sector. So that would probably move up against what can you bring, right? What, are, what is the values? The, the main thing they need to shift, and I'm sorry, I'm not answering directly your question no, on great. the West. Right? The main thing they need to shift in the global South is this uh, neoliberal idea that transportation pays for itself mm -hmm. because it doesn't. And it doesn't here in the North, right? Uh, the only places where transportation earns something or makes money is Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore. Real Tokyo and Hong Kong do it with real estate. Singapore does it by owning all the rolling stock and the capital and just putting out franchises, right? So the, the Global South needs to say, we need to move away from this entrepreneurial, which is really ride hail, if you think about it, without, and say, we need to invest money and pay money so that we get the kind of service that everyone deserves and can, can address uh, inequalities. And so if in the Global North, we, and this is something I, I've said in, in transportation conferences, right? The private, the startups are worried about government regulation. Don't worry about that. Look at government resources. Yeah. Where is government going to put its money? Because no urban transportation system exists without some form of government subsidy, whether it's for building out roads or paying for transit. 
Well, so last question then is, is that the final play here for the technology mobility companies, whether it's the micro mobility guys or Uber and Lyft here? Because yeah, there's, you know, there's a federal bailout for public transportation. There's federal funding that might become available again. You know, yeah, I mean, for years, I and others have warned that the end game for these was to burrow their way into public transport. And now we're sort of seeing, you know, are they going to try to get that federal subsidy to replace it? And we've seen, you know, Uber has new round of pilots in Miami-Dade, Marin, California, and others. You know, is that the end game? Uh, probably one of the steps to the end game. The thing with venture cap is you can come out of something once you've extracted, right? That's the whole point, right? So, so these, these services will exist in some form or the other. How we're going to pay for them is a question. And it's not like we haven't been here before. Remember streetcars? Those were all privately provided and mostly it's real estate companies so that then you could go to the streetcar suburbs. Mm -hmm. And then government started regulating it mostly because of the depression and war. And then it became not cost effective and buses came around and maintaining these huge systems were expensive. So they started turning it over to government, right? And then government found it expensive too. And the new technology was buses. So then we started shifting over to buses. So that helps. I think I'm much more worried about the control of the digital infrastructure mm -hmm. than I am about the rolling stock and services, right? Because at some point they're gonna be commoditized, right? You're not gonna care whether it's a jump, a bird or an Uber kick scooter you're using as long as it's available and can get you where it is. But who controls the uh, in information infrastructure that tells you the cost of the road, where you can pass, uh, how you're gonna pay for something. And that government's not equipped to do, but the map companies and Amazon and Apple and Google are equipped to do and which other ever services so that we may wake up one day and, uh, you know, private uh, interests control the digital infra uh, infrastructure of transportation. Well, that is a perfect segue. We're out of time, but that is a perfect segue. I would All encourage right. you, Benji, to attend. Our mutual friend, Anthony Townsend, author of Ghost Road, Beyond the Driverless Car, is going to be our special guest on the August 19th edition of Commotion Live. He'll be I just talked by... to him. <laughs> We all this. <laughs> well, he's, he's going to be joined by uh, Shared Streets' Kevin Webb, who, of course, you know, also a big player in this, and also Pittsburgh's Karina Ricks uh, and, uh, and NYU's uh, Henry Greenidge. Um, so we're going to discuss exactly this level of, yeah, the financialization of the data layer of mobility, how private interests will try to capture it, and more. So, um, so with that, thank you so much for joining us, Benji. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, viewers, uh, it's been a pleasure having you as well. Uh, welcome to the second beta test episode of the all new, all different Big Rethink. We'll be back hopefully next week with uh, an all new, all different episode and a brand new guest. Uh, thanks again to Benji for joining us and thank you so much for tuning in. Take care.